on Luke chapter 5. I want to take a look at Luke chapter 5. We're in the second week of a series about the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Conversations Jesus had with men and women that led to their transformation. Luke chapter 5. We looked at Luke chapter 5, the first 11 verses last weekend. We're going to look at Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to the end of the chapter this week. And let me just simply say, there are very few genuinely transforming people in the world. People like Isaac Newton and Einstein transformed the way we think about the universe. Much more recent than that, people like Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King Jr. transformed the way we think about race. Even more recent, if you're like me, a fan of their music, the Beatles transformed how we think about music. Steve Jobs transformed how we interact with technology. It can be beautiful as well as functional. Jeff Bezos transformed the way that we shop. He's the founder of Amazon. Anybody receive an Amazon box this week? Right. That's different. I thought Walmart was revolutionary 20 years ago. Now drones can deliver to our house, and that's transforming. Jeff Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, rather, founded Facebook, and he transformed what we think of when we think of friends. I've got something like 800, 700 of whom I don't know. And so... uh, or you might not have heard the name Larry Page, Sergey uh, Brin, but they founded Google and transformed the way we search for information. And very few truly transformational people. But when you want to think about God, and you want to think about how should I treat other people, it's Jesus Christ that is transformational. Luke chapter 5, we have this section of Luke 5, four conversations with four different people or groups of people, and in those four conversations, our ideas about God are transformed. In fact, let me give you what the theme of Luke chapter 5 is. What does this teach us? Jesus' power to transform explodes our expectations from God. Jesus, in these these conversations, is going to transform the lives of three individuals. And he's going to challenge an entire group of power brokers in the ancient world. And in so doing, he will simply explode that which you and I would in our natural mind think about God. Because probably the most common conceptions about God are something like this. God likes good people, is peeved at bad people. Or this one. We must work hard, do right, and take our chances on judgment day. (laughs) Or churches, if you want to broaden that to include religion, mostly is about creating a safe space for nice people. All of those are wrong assumptions about God. And yet those are some of the most common thoughts not only you and I, but our culture today has about God. And so from Luke chapter 5, Jesus is going to explode those kinds of myths, those kinds of thoughts. In fact, here's the truth. If you and I want to live a life that pleases God, or if you and I want to grow a church that pleases God, we need to think this way. (laughs) Include the unwanted. Invite the unworthy. And defend the unwilling. Life centered on those kinds of priorities reflect God's priorities, and they please him. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, let's follow the Lord through four conversations that help explode myths about God. Luke 5, verse 12, Jesus, again, he's at the the height of his ministry, very popular. Crowds always follow him wherever he goes. And in verse 12, while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. I have the word full underlined. It's emphatic in the original. The leprosy is a, a cluster of skin diseases. Uh, some more um, inconveniencing, some were life-threatening. Uh, along with the 
either inconvenient or ill health or threat to our life from leprosy came the social outcast of because of the lack of modern medical care in that day when someone came down with this and there was the concern about contagion, they were socially outcast. In fact, they were called to live outside of the city. They would have to leave their homes, their family. They couldn't even live in the home for fear of contaminating the home. And they would live outside the bounds of the village or the walls of the city. This is not only a suffering disease. This is a separating kind of a disease. And we're surprised, I guess, when in one of the cities a man came full of leprosy. And when Jesus, he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. The question has nothing to do with power. The question has everything to do with willingness. Lord, if you are so inclined, would be one way to translate this, you can make me clean. Here's someone in a public setting, a place he shouldn't be, he's an outcast, and he comes right into the city, that's bold, and he goes right in front of the Lord and he falls down in a way of humility and says, Lord, if you desire, I know you can make me clean. (laughs) But lepers are outcasts. They're not welcomed in polite company. How's Jesus going to handle this? Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. By the way, that was breaking a social taboo. Can we understand something really foundational about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is not worried about being defiled by the sinner or the disease. Jesus Christ is on the offense, and he restores the sinner and the disease. And in a a clear model, it was a breach of cultural norms, he didn't just say, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, stay away from me and I'll heal you. He reached out and he laid his hand on this man, and I love the way Jesus rephrased it, because it's as though he just gave the man's words right back into his, right back into his face, I will... And, and not, not like, yeah, sure, I'm on that. It's I am pleased. I am disposed to do this thing. I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Not a slow recovery over a series of weeks or months. At that moment, in front of everyone in this city watching this exchange, healing cleansing of a disease that had caused this man. We don't know how long. It says he was full of it, so it was fairly long in the process of disease. He's made right. And in verse 14, Jesus charged him to tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded. Interesting turn of phrase, the end of verse 14. As a proof to them, or for a proof to them. What's he saying? What's he saying? Well, here's the thing with leprosy. It, it, uh, Leviticus 13 and 14, you can have the Old Testament example of this. The priests sort of served as the health commissioners of that day. And so if you and I began to feel us, ourselves coming down with something, and it could be a contagious disease, we would go to the priest for an examination, and they would write us on a list saying, you got to come back in a week and see if that thing spread. And if it had, you were now leper. You were now out, and you had to leave the, uh, the village and the community. They kept a record, and from time to time, you could go back to the priest and say, hey, do you think this is better now? And and Jesus said, listen, listen, (laughs) go up to the temple, the priest that put you on the list of unclean, I want you to show you what I've done in your life. I want you to show him what I've done in your life, and there will be a written record that you are now clean, That, that, that there will be a notice to those who have a religious authority of the day, God's done a transforming work in your life. And verse um, 15, but now even more of the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him to be healed of their infirmities. Now look at verse 16. Popular, strong, lots of people coming to Jesus. They're flocking to him to hear his teaching, to be healed and uh, see the power of God in his life. And here's his response. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Luke, by the way, seven times in his his, uh, biography of Jesus, seven times makes the note that Jesus withdrew and prayed. 
if you and I are going to be serious about reaching people in our communities, we're going to be serious about pushing forward the power of the gospel, we're going to have to recognize that's going to take some work in our very souls, and that requires time with God. Don't, don't, don't just go busy, 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 do, do, do. Recognize God's going to do a refilling or restoring work in our lives, and that's going to happen through times of quiet and prayer. Now, look at the next conversation, verse 17. On one of those days, so, so we've had this tremendous public healing of a leper. Jesus has taken some time away to recharge and to be with God the Father. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. So what's happened is in Jesus' popularity, now the religious leaders are, uh, leaders are taking notice and they send witnesses. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Pharisees, by the way, you wouldn't say they're necessarily bad people, but they were certainly interested in keeping their power. And here's this explosion of popularity in the north, the north of Israel. Here's this guy that is healing people and teaching transformational truth. And so the religious authorities say, we want to check this out. And so they're here. And in this case, representatives from all over the religious leadership of Israel and um, I love the end of verse 17. I think this goes with withdrawing and praying. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Right? It's, it's very clear. The point is that it's the Lord's power exercised in Jesus' life. And that time away and praying recharged and resourced God's power. If the incarnate Son of God needed to get away to recharge, how do you think we, as fallen creatures, need the power of God in our lives? And on this occasion, as the Pharisees are there to witness this, God's power is evident in Jesus' life. And look at what happens, verse 18. Behold, take a look at this, is what he's saying. Behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But Finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles under the midst before Jesus. That's great. I mean, this crowd, and there's a guy, four guys, so you get, probably think of a sleeping bag, like a mat, and they would have tied knots on the four corners, and, you know, they're carrying or dragging this guy because he's paralyzed. He can't uh, get there, and he's, he's going to go see Jesus. This guy can heal me. And, and they get in the crowd is pressed in. And so they're like, well, what are we going to do? Well, you know, just look, there's the, there's the stairs on the outside of the house, very traditional in that, uh, uh, in that land, and we're going to go up on the roof, and they go up on the roof, and they begin to sort of dig through, pull up the tiles, and you, know, you can imagine Jesus sitting there teaching, he's sitting there teaching, and all of a sudden dust is beginning to fall down and that, and, and here comes a blanket with a guy in it, and four guys, you know, and and the Pharisees are watching. Now, honestly, honestly, as someone who speaks publicly for a living, that's distracting. <laughs> Any of you at the 11 o'clock last weekend? All right, great story. And so, uh, Tim, right about where you're sitting, uh, there was a family with a young boy, six, seven-year-old, and I wondered why didn't he go to children's church? Well, I found out about 30 minutes into my message, I'm getting down to my last point, and I hear, oh, oh. And then he just, he vomited. He just threw up all over the, yeah, right? You know, moms are like, oh, the guys are like, cool, what was that like? And, and I thought, well, and everybody right around totally knows, you know, it's like, whoa, hey, because it was rather vigorous. And, and people over here are like, huh, what's that? And I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm plowing on. But you know what kids do, uh, doctor, you know what kids do when they vomit, right? They cry. And so then it's a, ha, 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 and mom and dad are like trying to escort him out, and then he just launches again. Now at that point, honestly, I just if you're a public speaker, you cannot top vomit, right? <laughs> it's like the, it's the best, and so I just said, and in conclusion, and I closed, and a couple of people came to me afterwards and said, hey, it seems like you ended your message sort of, uh, you know, abruptly. I said, well, you know, just watch the 9 o'clock if you want to know how I really am supposed to end it. <laughs> You just can't top something like that. So this is what's going on. Now, it's, you know, it's not vomit, but it's pretty cool to see a guy coming down. And, and so he, he, he lands there in front of Jesus, and everybody's watching this. Look at verse 20. 
Now, you would think he might be irritated that they're interrupting a message or uh, that they're tearing up the house or whatever, but it's not. I love it. In fact, it's, it's, it's one of those things where the Lord just sort of throws us because he's so many steps ahead of, of where we're thinking. When he saw their faith, meaning the faith of the four men and the guy who probably recruited his buddies, hey, take me to go see Jesus. This man has power. He said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Bless you. And uh, it's like, what? What? I'm here for the healing, not the forgiving, right? And so uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? At that point, you're like, Jesus was thinking, exactly. <laughs> and uh, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, By the way, like, and who can read minds but God alone, too? And so... Uh, why do you question in your hearts? Look at verse 23. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? By the way, what's the answer to that? What's easier to say? Yeah? Well, okay, well, sorry. We've got a debate going on. Let's just kind of walk through this. Right? Same thing last night. Where there's a debate. Which is easier to say to someone, your sins are forgiven, or you're a paralytic person, get up and walk? What's easier to say? Yeah, for sure your sins are forgiven. Right? How do you prove that? But if a guy's been paralyzed to the point that his friends had to bring him to the, to the place, and this, because it's so dramatic, you know, with the, the, the blanket being lowered, everybody's got the attention there. Rise and walk is a pretty compelling thing to say. So uh, that's where Jesus goes next. But, verse 24, but so that you may know that the Son of Man, now this is what I have underlined in my, has authority. Do you remember what the, the leper said to Jesus, if you're willing? It's a question of willingness. Here the question is ability. Say, so, Okay, you've demonstrated you're willing to heal. Do you have the ability to forgive? Do you have the authority to do that? Jesus said, so you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. If you're writing a movie, this is the moment in the movie. Every eye in the house shifts from Jesus' words to the guy on the blanket. I mean, this is dramatic. Look at what happens. I love the way that Luke chooses his words so carefully. And when? Immediately. This is not a stretch. Immediately. <laughs> he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on. And went home glorifying God. Yeah, I'll, I'll guess, I guess he was. <laughs> a skip and a jump and a hallelujah out the door. And, and what do you say? What's the feeling around that crowd after that? Look at what comes next. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, We have seen, and the original word is paradox. We have seen extraordinary things. We're not fully sure we understand what we've seen today. And it's remarkable. And Yes, uh, Jesus is willing to heal those who are far away. And yes, Jesus is able to forgive the sins and heal those who are weak. Look at the next conversation. After this, sort of like, message delivered. <laughs> I will heal because I'm willing to heal. I will forgive because I have the authority to forgive. And now I will also call <laughs> people to follow me and Verse 27, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. So uh, think of a toll booth on the road, Main Street through this town, and, and there's a guy that you would have hated because he was working for the occupation. He was Jewish but working for the Romans. And, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Talk about the power of the Son of God to transform. D didn't say what the future hold, didn't promise him a promotion, didn't say that you know he could go back at the end of the week. He just said, follow me. And and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Verse 29, Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with him. So uh, the tax collector went and got his tax collector friends. And others, meaning probably other friends and others that worked in this sort of unsavory occupation. And, and they had a big party and Jesus was the guest of honor at the party at this house. And... 
And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you ever ask this question when your family invites you to a beer bash at their house? Christmas party? How about the summer's coming up? I know in our neighborhood we'll have our block party, you know, in mid-August. And loud and fun and a little crazy by the end of the night. And What do you think Jesus would answer you when you say, yeah, I don't know, should I go to that or not? Should I exclude my family because, you know, they don't live like I live? What do you think? Now, listen, I'm not talking about being foolish or, or I'm not talking about compromising. We don't do that. Jesus called Levi to leave that life and to follow him, but, but he never called him to isolate. Can we recognize how near to the heart of God are those that seem to be far away? And how Jesus just doesn't fear defilement from sin. He sends us to renew and restore. Be careful, be thoughtful, but be fearless with your family and your coworkers. The Pharisees lost sight of the fact that Jesus did not come to separate or isolate sinners. He came to restore them. And he sends us to do the same thing. In fact, look at his answer. The Pharisees, the scribes, grumbled, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? By the way, if you're the disciples, aren't you thinking, uh, uh, I would say that, uh, <laughs> and Jesus, and I, just because I think the Lord was such a great teacher, he probably let them dangle for a few moments, and then I, his response was this, Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I, get, I have this underlined, verse 32, it's one of those conversations, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I've not come to call sinners to stay in their sin. I've called them to come to repentance. It means a change of mind that change, leads to a change of heart. But I've come to call them, not to ignore them, not to isolate them. The fourth conversation is more pointed. And at this point, there's a transition in the book of Luke where there's a rising conflict with the religious leaders of the day because the religious leaders of the day didn't get what Jesus' mission was. And it's amazing, they should have, because they knew their Old Testament. And this was not new. In fact, what Jesus did was help us rediscover God's heart, all obvious throughout the Old Testament. And so, verse 33, they said to him, they meaning the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the, the scribes. A scribe is someone who writes. So they're, they're uh, uh, the writers and the scholars of the day. And hey, the disciples of John, meaning John the Baptist, fast often, and they offer prayers and so the disciples of the Pharisees, our own disciples do this, but your disciples eat and drink. There's probably an implied criticism because they just finished this party over at um, Levi, the tax collector's house, with all of his tax collector buddies. My guess is they didn't serve near beer either. <laughs> and uh, verse 34, Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom's with them? Of course not. You go to a wedding, you have a great time. The bridegroom's there, the bride's there, party, right? It's reception. And Jesus said, um, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away. He's speaking of himself. The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. He's predicting that one day he will die, he will then ascend, uh, re resurrect and ascend. There'll be a time when believers should fast, but not while he was here on the earth. That's time to celebrate. In verse 36, he told them a parable, and he actually tells three, uses three analogies here. And one is the bride and the bridegroom. Second, he also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on the old garment. If he does, he'll tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. You, you, don't, you don't patch an old sweater by cutting up a new one and putting it on. It's, nobody does that, right? Just throw away the old sweater or leave the old sweater as it is. And then he changes the analogy to... A wine and wineskins. Verse 37, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. What, what he's talking about is in the old days, the way they handled this in New Testament times was you would take a, a wineskin, would likely be an animal's intestine, right? I know, but that's what they did. And so, and uh, they would pour the unfermented uh, juice in there. And then it, oh, as time as it fermented and became wine, it would, it would stretch the animal skin. And it, when it was fully stretched, it was ready to go. And 
But, but if you then tried to reuse that, it's already stretched, and you put more new wine in, and you're going to let that grow. It's going to burst that thing. It's going to ruin it. That's what he's saying. It'll just You're going to ruin both the wineskin and lose the wine. And so here's his analogy. Uh, verse 38, new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. What Jesus is doing is too transformational to be contained in what you and I have thought previously. Or the old wineskins the Pharisees had constructed about how God ought to be treating people. You, you, try, and, you try and fit the gospel into that, it's going to blow it apart. In fact, he says of people, verse 39, no one after drinking old wine desires new. He says the old is good. Pharisees say, ah, you know, what we got is good. I don't want something new. <laughs> it's controversial. When God goes to work, it's transformational, and there are a lot of structures that simply can't handle that kind of change and transformation. So uh, lessons, we learned about God from these four conversations that we overheard Jesus have with people. First is this, Jesus is willing and able to meet our needs, ask boldly. Jesus is willing and he is able to meet our needs, ask boldly. I'm speaking right now to those who may perceive themselves to be helpless or far from God or outcast or feeling like God is far away. Understand this truth. He is willing, he is able, ask boldly. <laughs> I love the heart of the leper who said, I'm going to come into the city, I'm going to cross boundaries because I want to be healed. And I love the heart of the four friends and the paralytic who said, God, do something in my life. And the Pharisees simply had excluded those kinds of people, saying God is mostly for nice people who pose no threat to our church or our assembly. And I'm saying there are those who have felt on the outside for a long time and they have tried their best to earn God's favor and they have become more and more frustrated and there are those who are already believers who feel like, you know, I've blown it too many times and God must be angry at me and maybe I'll make heaven by the skin of my teeth. I want to read to you from Isaiah 55. Because I want you to see that what Jesus preached, what he taught, how he conversed about God was not something new. I read Isaiah 55 in my quiet time this week and it just, it leapt off the page. I've known it, of course, for years. But as I'm reading through Luke 5 and seeing Isaiah 55, I'm thinking, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Isaiah 55 is an invitation to God's own people. You want to know about the heart of God? You want to know about God's willingness and his ability to work with those we might seem or we might think are far away or helpless? The lepers and the paralytic, listen, listen, listen. Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 2 is one of the most compelling questions you will ever hear, and it's from the lips of our God in heaven. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Is that not a question? What do I do? Incline your ear. Listen diligent to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear. Come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. As I had loved and promised to David, I will love and promise to you. Look at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Why? That he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I mean, do you get that? I don't know if I can understand that. Well, look at the next verse. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And all God's people said, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. 
and God does not treat sinners as their sins deserve. That's our thinking, not his thinking. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as, heavens, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Back in Luke chapter 5. Jesus is willing and able to meet our needs. Ask boldly. He is not threatened or defiled by the sinner. He restores the sinner and brings renewal and joy. And he doesn't do it by leaving us in our sin. He does it by cleansing us from our sin. Listen, hear me. If you have not trusted Jesus Christ, if you have not forsaken your own trust in religion or ritual, do that today. Why would you labor for that which does not satisfy? You simply believe in Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God. He died on the cross. He rose again. Turn away from whatever you're trusting till now and believe him. By the way, child of God, believer, it's the same process for us. We still need Jesus to forgive our sins long after we've begun walking the path of faith. Do that. Find renewal. Find restoration. Why would we labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Second, Jesus calls the unlikely to do the improbable. So follow fearlessly. You may or may not know, if you know your Bible history, that Levi, that tax collector, later changed his name to Matthew and wrote the first and most familiar biography of Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew. That's transformational. Those that God seems to accomplish the most with are those that seem like, you know what, they're the least likely. He calls the unlikely to do the improbable, follow fearlessly. You're up against it on your job, you're up against it in a relationship, financially, whatever. And you and I face choices. Will I trust that following Jesus gets me to the uh, best place? Will I trust that following him and walking his way will do the greatest good in my life and be the most transformational in my culture? Fearlessly follow him. He will do the most unlikely things in the lives of those who you would never expect that. Our church is filled with men and women who shouldn't be here. I have so many friends who are pastors who have no business being pastors. But God stepped in and transformed. And they didn't buy the lies of the common culture about a church being a safe place for nice people. And that blows up wineskins, doesn't it? Don't you be afraid. Don't you let your past hold you back. Fearlessly follow. Third. Jesus explodes the things that obscure God's purposes. Think carefully. Jesus' loving, kind, welcoming, an open hand towards those who were the least, but those who were the most religious and rigid, he was the most difficult. In fact, he was the hardest with. We need to think differently. We need to make sure that our thinking and our approach to life matches up with God's approach to life. Let me see if I can't put some specific, speci- let me see if I can't make this specific. What's the word I'm thinking? How do you say it? Yeah, you can't say it either, so. <laughs> Did you say specificity? This is what happens when I don't write these things down. That came off the cuff. And so uh, what I have in my notes are these. Marks of wrong thinking. That's a little clearer, isn't it? Marks of wrong thinking. I have a rising frustration with people or church. Especially if a church is doing the thing God's called it to do, which is reaching out to people. And that makes me uncomfortable, and I have a rising frustration about that. Before we blow up the church or the relationships we have with other people, let's think about, am I clear? Is my process of thinking line with what Jesus is doing? A growing resentment or conflict with other people. If I have a series of conflicts, especially unresolved, 
or, or a series of resentments, and it just sort of is a low, it's like, a, it's like a, a pan on a burner on low, and it's just constantly simmering, constantly simmering, and I can just fly off the handle quick. Maybe the, pr- I'm just saying, maybe the problem's not with every other person in our life. <laughs> maybe there needs to be some restructuring of how we see the world. Or how we think about what God might be doing in the life of that person that's irritating me. Or what God may be doing in my life through that person that's irritating me. Third, this is a, this is a big one, one with which I have to deal, not only in my own life, but with those often who come for counsel. Sometimes I'll find this, there's an entitlement mentality. God owes me this because I'm a pretty good guy. I didn't sign up for this to happen in my life. Make it right. <laughs> and the Pharisees are like, hey, hey, we're pretty good people. What are you doing letting the lepers and the paralyzed in? Come on, we got this thing going pretty good. And then entitlement. God ought to act the way we want God to act. And Jesus said, that's, that's going to burst the wineskins. Honestly, a lot of people will think, you know, God owes me. Let me just clarify that. No, he doesn't. I owe him. God will do in his life what is for his glory and for my good, even if in the short term that doesn't seem to make sense. Let me tell you how much your tension will go down when we give up an entitlement mentality. We may need four friends to bring us to Jesus. He doesn't owe us anything. Fourth is a history of changing jobs or marriages or churches. There's great reasons to change jobs. There's great reasons to change churches. There's an extremely limited reason, number of reasons why one would ever change a marriage. But so many people sort of bring that baggage with them into the next relationship or the next job or the next church. Will you, can I just have some honest thinking about, did I, did I bring some of this on myself? Is my thinking clear? This, this is where good friends can maybe tell us the truth and what a blessing it would be. But before you make the next change, before you transform something for the, for the wrong reasons, think really carefully about what God is doing in your life through those commitments. Fifth, there can be a growing separation from people different from us. There's often that sense of, I want people that look like me and think like me, that's safe, it doesn't ask much of me. But thank God, Jesus Christ crossed all kinds of cultural barriers to save me and to heal a leper and to restore a paralytic and to call a tax collector. And then he calls us to follow him into uncomfortable situations with people who are different than us Don't draw that circle so tight that it only includes people just like us. Let me say that our church, as much as God enables us to do, will be a place that welcomes people very different from us. In fact, we will seek them out. Not for some kitschy, trendy diversity thing. Jesus was way ahead of that curve 2,000 years ago. But because the gospel is so powerful to transform, it unites others who may, may have no other reason to ever get together. Third, finally, the prescription for us is that we need to rediscover God's love for people, for those that are far from him. You know, the challenge in in Revelation to one church that got a little bit closed and ingrown was remember your first love. Remember when Jesus saved you, how good that was? Will you extend that to others? I'm going to invite the worship team here. Let, let's sing to close. Let me tell you a story about a pretty girl I met. And um, didn't know hardly anything about her because she's pretty quiet. And so I invited her to go with me on a date. And I showed up at her house. My dad's 1974 Chevrolet Bel Air, powder blue, a block long, <laughs> AM radio, cloth seats. And uh, when I, guys, listen, young guys, I got out of the car, I went up to the door, I knocked on the door, and guess who answered the door? Her father. So there's a message to dads, there's a message to boys, right? 
And uh, after the, and he's taller than I am, and it's like, ooh. And uh, we got into the car, and I uh, got ready to turn the car on, and from the, as far away in the front seat as she could be, I heard this, hey, Scott, will you pray? I'm like, on a date? <laughs> Don't you pray after the date for forgiveness? You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's... And something was so transformational about a young girl who loved the Lord more than she loved what I thought about her, that that began the process that a month later led to me coming to Christ. And I loved her so much that I married her. Don't you think God can't use you to transform? Just follow him. Jesus, we want to do that. Help us to follow you. Thank you for your word. Lord, I just love preaching about Jesus. God, I pray for those feeling heavy-hearted today. May they find in you the power of transformation, forgiveness, cleansing, wholeness, renewal. Oh, God, will you and I help us, Lord, to be, help us to be instruments, to be tools to offer that kind of restoration to others. Lord, in the power of the gospel, I pray, protect our church, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's people agreed by saying.